you never know. Right, so cheese. Um, cheese, 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 cheese. What do we know about cheese? We all love cheese, don't we? Do you like, oh, forget about you, Alan. You don't like anything. Jean, uh, Jean, Gillian, do you like cheese? No. Oh, right, forget it. Do you like cheese? I love cheese. She, he likes cheese, good. We Most of us like cheese in the room except for Kathy, Alan, and do you like cheese? I love cheese. You like cheese, but once you like something. <laughs> Um, but obviously, obviously, um, the, the quick question we need to ask really is how many of us have got cheese um, at home? Yeah, 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 yeah. How many of us have got bread at home except for Kathy? Yeah. Yeah, I've got bread. Wine? Yeah. Oh, forget. Yeah. yeah. Not yet. So, oh, no, you get ale this week. Um, so the main thing is the you can you can say as a snapshot that uh, that cheese. Wine, butter, all these things, bread, are all staples of society as they are today. Um, now, the first, the first story that we have here, probably can't see it. Oh, there you go. Um, in 1885, tomb raiders in ancient Egypt discovered the final resting place of Tafnes, a powerful mayor of Memphis who, who ruled between 1290 BC and 1213 BC. Um, which I think is highly unlikely because it's a hell of a long time. But anyway, uh, that's probably his, his lifespan. Um, Shifting Sands, after they'd um, looted his tomb, um, reburied his tomb. And it was only in 2010 that they actually started re-looking at the excavation site. And when they started re-looking at the excavation site in 2010, the raiders left as we see today, some of the most valuable um, commodities, product, uh, staple behind, i.e. the world's oldest cheese. Um, cheese, cheese, and cheese. Cheese itself, uh, which is over 3,200 years old, had survived. Um, and why is this important? It's important because it connects us with everything that we've been doing. We've been looking at wine, we've been looking at the other uses of bread, the other uses of honey, and all these wonderful things that we take um, for complete granted. And the other thing as well is we can think about the other, um, the other thing that we've been putting in quite, um, quite a lot really, um, is that cheese, butter, wine can be used for everything other than to eat or drink. Um, as we're starting to see that many of these things that we have in our cupboards at home have of other applications. Found in a storeroom among a number of broken jars, the solidified whitish mass was, was initially barely recognisable. It appeared to be entirely composed of sodium carbonate, as we now know the basis of soap, although it was covered with a bit of fabric that resembled a cheesecloth. Um, they eventually identified and theorized that if the substance had once been cheese, it had, um, it had reacted with the exceptionally dry, salty and alkaline environment to turn the fats um, it had contained into soap. Lots of things um, change their um, structure, um, their, their chemical structure over time. Um, even when the likes that we look at... Um, um, uh, stillborn children being placed in earthenware jars and covered in honey, um, the honey absorbs the flesh from those um, stillborn uh, babies um, and obviously the whole structure of the honey again has changed. Lots of things change over time. People thinking that bog uh, butter itself tastes um, very similar to some of those runny cheeses around the world today, that bog butter may have tasted very different a thousand years ago. Things change, and people's idea of taste changes as well. I'm sure uh, a packet of porn cocktail crisp when we're a child tastes very different from what a pack of porn cocktail crisp tastes today. Uh, is that because our palates change? Is it because the ingredients have changed? You know, all these different factors need to come into it. And I bet you, if you had a pack of prawn cocktail um, crisps, if you kept it in the cupboard for 30 years and you ate it today, uh, would have a completely different taste. Again, the, the chemical structure has completely altered. The, the, the secret in the world's oldest cheese there is this absolutely mega, this huge chunk of cheese, massive chunk of cheese. 
Um, and when we, when we think about this, we, we might need to think about what the cheese was doing there for this, this very important official. Was it as a gift? <coughs> was this individual going to consume this cheese throughout the rest um, of their life um, amongst the stars? We don't know. So we've got lots to look at. Um, and we, we, we've, looked at, we've looked a tiny bit about cheese in Egypt. Um, we'll come back to that. And scientists find evidence of 7,000-year-old cheese um, in Neolithic villages in Croatia. Uh, there you go. They're excavated a field in Croatia. Those to me look like grapevines. Um, probably are. Croatia's on the opposite side of the Adriatic from um, Italy, for example. Uh, part of the old U Yugoslavia. Um, so thank you that they are great finds. And amongst this, they, they undertake an archaeological excavation. You can imagine the archaeologist on the break time just um, um, eating the grapes. Lovely thing to do. Um, but the one thing to be said before I go on, go on to talk about this article is that it seems that food is one of the new frontiers in archaeology. Um, one of the new frontiers in archaeology is to look at the role disability had um, with individuals in the past and how we perceive disability. That's one of the new frontiers of archaeology. The other frontier is to actually really understand what we're finding in the ground is more than we think it was. So say, for example, Lynn, if I showed you a wonderful Roman vase um, at this moment and I plonked it in front of you on the table, what are the questions you'd be asking about that vase? Yeah, all those questions, yeah. But if you're an archaeologist, now this is a good point, if you're an archaeologist, you've actually answered the question right, so I don't need to say any more. Um, uh, if you're an archaeologist, I would publish that, um, an image of that, I would do all the dimensions, tell you where it was all from and all the rest of it, but it'd be very unlikely that I'd give you any indication to what uh, it was used for, what was stored in it. You look at these wonderful archaeological publications, reams and reams of the uh, publications, and with wonderful illustrations of pots. But very rarely do archaeologists ever discuss what these things could have stored. Okay, um, it's a bit like um, I'm going to pick on Ellen for a second. It's a bit like you yanking all the teeth out of people's mouths without giving them a reason why you're doing it. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make is that archaeologists need to start asking what these containers were used to store, okay? And what these containers uh, were used to store is now key to understanding past societies. Um, now, one thing that Cathy and I have done many times is washed copious amounts of pottery, haven't we, Cathy? All right, but okay, I'm the only one in the room. I've washed loads of pottery right, in my time. I used to be, in, in my very younger years, okay, um, when I was your age, Gillian, I used, to, um, I used to wash pottery by the bucket load, day in, day out, as a volunteer at Cosmeston Medieval Village. Throughout the age of nine, I did it, I did it uh, for a few years every summer, and I used to wash this pottery. Nobody ever said to me, uh, if you see this and that attached to it, you can't wash it, right? I used to wash the whole lot, right? But uh, loads of it, right? But nobody ever said to me um, that the pottery you're washing could have contained this or that. Nobody ever thought to even mention that to me. But now, um, as we're looking at these, the, the, the variety of lectures that we're looking at, and, and due to the discoveries at Must Farm in Peterborough, we're now starting to see the pottery itself, even though the contents are now long since rotted away, the pottery itself may actually contain a trace of those acids and those fats and those salts and all those other wonderful chemical signatures um, which would indicate what those containers once stored. And that is really, really important. Is it, it should now be said that you can't wash all the artifacts on an archaeological site. You need to keep a sample which is really, really difficult, is it not? You've got a tray of Roman Samian ware on the table. 
You want to wash it all and glue it together. But there's some residue on the inside and the outside of that Roman Samian ware. You can have a wonderful uh, piece in the middle of the table all glued back together. We know exactly who made it, what year, where it was from and all the rest of it. Yeah. But isn't it wonderful to have the science now to work out what was being stored in it? Okay. What they were ex what they were eating. We can we can get um, tartaric tar 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 acids in in the wall of the pot to try and work out that they were eating grapes, or they they may have been uh, there may be other some uh, citric acids in there. We may have had some oranges and lemons and all the rest of it. That same in my bowl. We know exactly what was stored in it or kept in it for people to consume. And I think that's a wonderful way that archaeology is actually going in. Um, the other thing as well is, and the other point I'd like to make. Is, is that here, one, uh, one, 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 singular, that means that one of two or three, one of the archaeological sites in Croatia where the cheese residue was discovered. Um, it's strange, is it not, um, that when new discoveries are being made, i.e. Um, they're actually starting to find traces of um, tartaric acids, um, on the walls of earthenware jars in Georgia that they actually are excavating somewhere else and actually finding other evidence in Israel at the same time that people were um, consuming wines um, six, seven thousand years ago. Um, it seems that the scientific research is being done at the same time. And in Croatia, they excavate in one site and they find bits of pottery that have lactic acids on them um, and there are lipids, lipids on them, um, you folk. Um, and they're actually working out one site that they've got cheeses indicated at that site 7,000 years ago. On another site, they've got cheeses indicated over there 7,000 years ago. It seems that it, this is an explosion of research. Um, the, the residues are actually being found on these uh, wonderful uh, fragments of pottery from the past. So those fragments of pottery from the past are even more important than those table pieces um, that we've alluded to. Neolithic tribes in Europe were producing cheese um, at least 7,000 years ago, even beyond. And cheese has another meaning. Um, cheese has a great meaning um, because it's talking about taste, um, the body's ability to consume um, milk, okay, the body's ability to consume cheese has only evolved um, as we're seeing it into the uh, 18, 19 um, hundreds um, into just sort of going on the shelf eating cheese. Some people wouldn't be able to eat cheese um, <coughs> 200 years ago because they'd be intolerant to it, okay? Um, it, and the human body has now started to absorb um, these cheeses um, and, and the milks and so on. And this has been an evolution that we're finding in archaeology. Um, if you're a child, you can drink uh, cow's milk, pig's milk, it's fine. But suddenly there's a cutoff point and you, 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 you're, you're only, your body's unable to cope with it. Diarrhea and sickness, um, becoming intolerant. Archaeologists discovered after cheese residue was found in pottery, discovered the excavations in Croatia. Analysis of the fatty residues revealed evidence of soft cheeses, like the one I showed you earlier on, that, that stank to hell, high heaven, and yogurts dating back um, over 7,000 years, 4,000 years before the previously known date for cheese making that we see in ancient Egypt, that was the first piece we looked at. Um, this is one of those. This is one of those things that I remember telling Kathy four years ago. Whatever I'm telling you now is the oldest. Um, a few years time, um, there'll be something even older and something even older. Did I not say that, Kathy? Okay. Yeah, good. Okay, that's, that's good. That's, uh, do, can you remember coming here five years ago and me saying that, Keith? No. Why not? Because I was asleep. You were asleep, exactly. <coughs> you could have just agreed with me and people would have called you a liar because you weren't here four years ago. So this pushes, this pushes um, cheese making back 4,000 years. The discovery was made at two archaeological sites in Croatia where the remains of Neolithic villages and evidence of house structures were found along with sto stone tools, pottery fragments and animal bones. So all this is coming together, we're, 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 we've got a leveller there. Where we would usually see on an archaeological site, bits of pottery, the animal bones and the tools. We're actually understanding what was actually um, contained within that pottery, okay? Um, 
And the, we now, <coughs> we're now starting to get the technology to understand that those t stone tools uh, were cutting down certain types of trees. Um, um, and we're starting to work out that those animal bones were being used for this and that. You know, so, so we're starting to really understand. So now you're wandering into um, a Neolithic kitchen um, and you're able to work out <coughs> what's in that bowl over there um, and what they might be preparing <coughs> over there. Um, we, we know some of their meals now that they were, they were eating, for example, in the Bronze Age for the, because of the, the evidence that's been found at Must Farm. And if you look at Otzi the Ice Man, 5,000 years ago, again, you can work out what Otzi has taken with him to survive in those very cold conditions. An international team found that Neolithic uh, people in the area were um, using pottery vessels to hold milk as far back um, as 7,700 years ago. Um, and it's saying that obviously these vessels may have been used to ferment the products, um, the cheese and the yogurt, maybe separating the curd from the whey by heating up um, the vessels that actually contain the milk in the first place. So all this information um, is now starting to push the boundaries of archaeology again. When, 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 what I used to say in archaeology, that um, all we have in archaeology is the bones, and even then we don't have the full set of um, remains, okay? Some of the bones are missing, but now what we're starting to do is put a bit of muscle on those bones and a tiny bit of flesh. I don't know if we'll, we'll be able to work out how people spoke um, 4,000 years ago. But I'm sure somebody will come up with, a, with some kind of scientific equation, some kind of evidence um, to capture that echo of people's voices in the past. This is the way technology is going. Um, space science. The real, frontiers, the real frontiers of space, I do believe, are on this planet. That we've still got so much to learn without going into space. Um, this, these, are, these are the type of containers um, that they've got. 7,000 years ago. Um, and after they have um, taken the sample um, from this pottery, so internally, we're able to understand, obviously, about the cheeses and the yogurts and all the rest of it. But um, I can remember um, years ago, I, I'm, I'm the only archaeologist to excavate at the medieval village um, at Lan Lancovian, which is outside Cowbridge, which is mentioned in my forthcoming book. Um, but I can remember we had lots of pottery back then that, that, that were encrusted um, with um, sediment on the outside, um, with, with really thick sort of charcoal sediment on the outside. I can remember that some of our bags have still actually got that sediment on the outside, and maybe that was a wise thing to do. Because um, by looking at the sediment on the outside of the pots as well, we can work out what type of temperatures um, the pot was having to endure, and to have to, having to endure what? the heating, what was inside. So all that is really, really important that we, that we actually take care to understand actually what's out there. There you go. The fatty acids detected on um, ceramic fragments from Croatia. Archaeological sites containing evidence of the earliest known cheese. So there you go. So um, I think... Um, I, I think as, as things progress in archaeology um, positively outside the country, um, we're starting to understand um, about our sense of humanity. And I use the word outside the country for a reason, but we won't talk about politics at this minute. Um, so this, this next thing here, um, this is an important line. The switch in diet necessitated the production of different containers the switch in diet, that, that little bit there, um, and why is that so important? That's important because um, <coughs> to start um, consuming um, milk and cheeses um, on, an, on another scale means that the body is adapting to that change. Um, the absorption rate um, of all those um, acids which we're now able to cope with 7,000 years ago. Um, some people, I, I know um, some people, well, like Kathy, you can't have any cheese products at all, can you, Kathy? Exactly. So don't take this the wrong way, okay? Um, it's going you to gonna sound that way. Um, your, your body and your makeup hasn't evolved um, in 7,000 years, where my body has. 
okay? But I can only, I'm, I'm get, my, my body is, is more akin to dealing with goat's milk rather than cow's milk. If I have too much goat's milk, um, I have an, a reaction that affects my asthma, okay? So I have, my body hasn't completely evolved, but it's not the human condition to consume milk and cheeses, okay? Um, your body has evolved to consume cheese and milk. But Kathy's body is not meant to be that way, and my body is not meant to consume large amounts of products from a cow. So, and it's talking about a switch in diet. This, this is an evolutionary switch in diet. Can I ask you a question, Kathy? Right, really interesting one. When you were a child, were you able to drink copious amounts of milk? Yes, I did. Bingo, that's, that's it. So, so your body is still... But I got lots of egg whites and things. Yeah, but you didn't know it was about the milk back no, then. And, but nor did our ancestors. My mother. Yeah. Got really sick and became very ill and then she got sick again. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the point trying to the point being made here um, is that everything in our human body is geared to evolve without milk and cheeses. Um, I know uh, Ellen is is faithful that you've mentioned um, um, being a dentist. Okay. Well, it was golf that day. Golf, you 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 you've really done it. But but you know that used to be the old thing, didn't it, Ellen? About Drinking loads of milk, good for your teeth, maybe? There was a pub here which um, the guy or the guy who was called Peter used to go and he used to always know what time it was at. Yeah. But it's obviously I was very much trying to to go and switch my teeth off. But obviously but you're gonna have also got up because yeah. we saw um Ralph in the store and went to the pub afterwards to see him about so I then went and bought sweets and made it for him. That's right. In the very so early years. Very early yeah. years. Because a large proportion of diet is going to come from the animal blood. Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so this, this is all, this is all really interesting stuff. So what we've got to look at is your body was probably evolving to develop those ch teeth without the requirement of those um, animal milk products, and that's the point that I'm trying to make. That. Um, uh, um, suddenly somewhere along the line there's whole populations on this planet that can't tolerate milk as we've already mentioned um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that there are different evolutionary um, branches uh, that have sent the body to deal with uh, milk and cheeses where Kathy can't but w this is the point um, lots of the research says that um, for a short period of time, say about 8,000 years ago, people th it was sort of discussed, oh, you know, let, let's consume some of the milk from that, from that cow. Let's consume some of the milk from that goat. And we'll give it to the children for a short period of time because the mother's out working in the field. And there's all these different things. Let's just not get that picture of the past. But gradually people are starting to think, right, milk, cheese, you know, um, let's bring it into our diet. So that's an, that's an evolution. Um, and, and Kathy is still with us. Um, so avoiding che cheese and milk um, has probably done you a lot of good. Bingo. So, so um, talking about the upside, that is the upside. So cheese production, cheese production itself, we're talking now about cheese production. People producing cheese um, creates a cultural shift, not just in a mindset, but in a physical way as well. Um, the, the ability to have cheeses, the ability to have cheese um, that has a longevity um, means that you're able to be a bit more mobile, okay? Having things that you can move around with you means that you can go from A to B, which is 100 miles away, but you're gonna be able to travel with food. You couldn't go from A to B um, before all these portable things like um, cheese and breads and honeys because you've got to support you've got to move a to sort of just down the road and hunt a little bit and you've got to go down back because you're restricted by what you can um, catch that day right to be able to store things to be able to keep things to be able to have these longevity of products means that you can go further so the human population is widening out its net its catchment out there um, so 
all the evidence starts to see um, the evidence of being used um, to um, store and actually cheese production as well. We, we're starting to see that um, we've got evidence of bowls and plates and sieves and various vessels which were used um, in the cheese making process. Um, and what we're starting to see now, 7,000 years ago, this is the earliest documented lipid residue evidence for fermented dairy in the Mediterranean region, among the earliest documented anywhere to date. Um, I can remember covering in Archaeology World Report, which I edited back in 2002, uh, we, we, we had a, there was a professor at um, Oxford University called Professor um, Sherat, and Professor Sherat was, was the leading uh, mover uh, in uh, the, the analysis of pottery. You know, he was saying, look, if we, if, we, if we don't wash everything, we actually start looking um, at the inside of these pots, you can actually see if they, they were used for storing milk or yogurt, um, or cheeses, or butters, and all these other things. And he was a mover in this. He was a revolutionary mover. He's no longer with us today, but the work that he started has actually gone on and on and on. We're now starting to identify sites, um, such as these sites in Croatia, and Egypt, and elsewhere. And maybe, if they, if they look a little bit more at the samples at Mass Farm in Peterborough, they might actually find more evidence of, of storing those wonderful goods from the past. When did they first domesticate cattle? And presumably, once we've done that, then we would have started producing milk and cheese. So, the two would have together. I, I think, to be honest with you, right, I think the word domestication is a huge red herring. And the reason why it's a huge red herring is because it discounts the ability of our human ancestors to work with what they've got. For example, making bread. Lots of what we were talking about when we were making bread. We, we mentioned that they were making bread 25,000 years ago, right? But that was from wild grains. That wasn't from domesticated grains. That was from wild grains. Even the evidence from 12,000 years ago of, of making um, flatbreads, for, for example. And, and you're talking about natural, um, yeah, natural yeast, for example. You know, risen bread, oh my God, 12,000 years ago, there's no way. But yes, there is way. Um, but this, is, this was reliant upon wild varieties, okay? So um, I fall for this trap, you've fallen for the trap in your own question. Um, um, you know, when we started domesticating cows, um, sheep, goats, pigs, and all the rest of it, it's at that point we start to realize that there's milk and we start to drink it and we start to um, sort of make it into cheese and all the rest of it. I think the answer is, is that that was occurring long before domestication, okay? You know, a wolf, has milk, okay? Human being has milk, okay? Um, and... But would you be able to get up, I mean, you wouldn't get up to a wild bull or something like that, a wild cow, and be able to no, take you milk from it, would you? Because it'd be very defensive. Yeah. But then, then again... Um, there must have been an element of domestication, whatever the word you want to use. Um, but to then, taste milk. Then, then again, you've fallen for the other trap. Um, we, you know, we... we we looked after a crow. The crow got um, very friendly with us, and it's it um, um, you know it it, it it started to live with us in the bedroom and all the rest of it. You know, and it started to fly out, fly around, and all the rest of it. It was very it, it was very wild, right? Well, for it, for it's tamed. Yeah, but it, it was tamed, and I think that's the word we need to look yeah, for. The word tamed. tamed. If um, some animals are approachable, some some animals want to be with us. Some animals. I, that's not really domestication. That's not domestication because it's still the same beast. Okay? It's said, for example, with the evidence um, up north on the um, um, Northumberland coast um, of Howick. When they excavated the site of Howick, they had the remains of, um, they couldn't work out the remains of a wolf um, or a normal dog, a normal canine. They couldn't work it out, right? Um, but it doesn't mean to say the wolf wasn't living with a human, but it was still a wolf. It was still fully blood, um, bloodied wolf, okay? Um, and I think the point we need to make here, it's very dangerous to say domestication, we've got that revolution. Um, now we're starting to say that we don't need to have domestication to have that revolution. We can, we can have small amounts of what we take for granted today in the past, okay? We can still have breads in the past, but we haven't... Um, we, we haven't domesticated um, einkorn, for example. 
Um, we, we can have milk, but we haven't domesticated um, that auroch over there. It's just a friendly auroch with a calf, and there's some, it's got lots of milk, you know? And I know it sound, may sound ridiculous, but it's not, because this is what the archaeolog archaeological evidence is telling us, quite frankly. <laughs> that, I, I'm not saying that at all. It's an example, Kathy. But what, what, what we're getting at um, is, is that um, uh, you can see a way in and you can see that there's an ability. Um, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a really um, crude example. Um, a few years ago, um, I, I couldn't bear burying my, my chickens when they, when they died. And there was this one chicken... Um, and um, how do I do this in a non-gory non way? Um, I, I, I would burn them, right? Because we know if we buried them, the fox would come in and dig them up. So we'd burn them. And uh, one, one day, I, 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 I was burning this chicken, and uh, it had three stages of eggs developing inside the chicken, right? And, and I think, Christ, their eggs are, their, their eggs actually inside the bird, Yeah. Um, so, looking at that example, right, you're cooking the bird, um, you've got the eggs, you're thinking, oh, right, let's start eating the eggs, we start eating the eggs. It's the, it's the, same, it's the same with um, a fully laden um, auroch with a lot of milk inside her, right? She, she's been downed by a human being or, or a wolf or whatever, and that milk is leaking, right? You talk about human drinking milk from a reindeer... Uh, not milk from a reindeer, blood from a reindeer. I've seen, I've seen it, right? People milk the rain, the milk the reindeer's blood. They drink the blood, okay? So I'm sure if you could drink blood, Gillian, you can drink milk from an auroch, okay? So I'm not shouting you down, but I want us to look at this differently. I want us to say, sod the idea of domestication. Everything that we've been seeing is evolution. Um, by the back door, um, it's it's like a it's like a good relationship. Um, you're with somebody a lot, and you and you you don't know you're falling in love with them, but suddenly you're falling in love with them, and you're in a relationship. Okay, this is what human evolution's about: little things, slowly but surely, and it starts to evolve. Um, I'll go on a little bit further, then we'll have a break. So. Um, Lots of different types of pottery indicating um, cheese making, making at the site in Croatia. Um, and also, the, the key element is the age old um, scientific technique, radiocarbon dating, was used to determine the age of pottery. We not only know that they were making cheese in it, we know the age of the pottery as well. Uh, the development cheese making, now this. If, 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 I, if I didn't do any more now, and this, this is really important, the development of cheese making may have opened northern European areas to farming because it reduced infant mortality and allowed for earlier weaning, uh, decreasing the birth interval and potentially increasing population. Don't say anything. Um, because it also says that um, if you use um, milk for um, um, weaning, um, from wild animals and the cheese is normal. That's then there might be an allergic react reaction. But that's only with a small number. A small number. Um, the point being made here is if you're if you're able um, if you're able to develop the human population by the in introduction of milk and cheeses, so that populations can sort of. Uh, keep moving into different areas of Europe that you've got the milk and, and you've got the cheeses that you're able to move with you. The populations are able to move, potentially as well increasing human populations. Because if, if a child um, has that direct contact and is able, able to be looked after, the child's going to have a much better ability to live into um, parenthood, okay? Um, meaning that the requirement of a woman to give birth um, to multiple children and most of them die is reduced and that's really really important um, in fact increasing human populations um, and a better gene pool um, for, for people moving into Europe 
with a food source that could buffer the risk of farming in colder um, northern climate, farmers could expand their territories. So you're able to, if you're able to move with this new stored food, this new ability, um, it's acting as a buffer in those cold winter months. Look at the example in Greenland. The Greenland um, archaeological work. You're, you're, going, you're going on a long journey um, from Iceland, which would be a few days, over to Greenland. You've no idea where you're going, but you know over there somewhere, or maybe there. There, there, there's a land um, th um, that is full of milk and honey. Sorry for the pun. Um, it, it's, it's quite, it's quite a, a rich landscape, and the temperature is a little bit warmer than Iceland. Um, you need to have stored food to get you there. And when you get there, you can't just wander around eating any old thing, okay? Because you're not going to have the ability to do that. You need enough food when you get there to tide you by whilst you're trying to raise crops, whilst you're trying to forage, whilst just um, bringing on um, the, the new population of cattle and sheep. And to be able to store all these wonderful things that we've been talking about over the past few weeks and to be able to find the evidence in the pottery itself is where the new frontiers of archaeology are going. Um, so obviously it mentions Egypt there and the Croatian cheese. Um, being these two um, new benchmarks to understand that cheese itself is an essential staple uh, within our past. So what we're going to do now, we're going we're gonna to take a nice little break. Um, <coughs> Gough, Gough can um, sample the Edinburgh ale. Um, I don't see why not, he's not driving. Um, are there any questions? doesn't actually mention where because one thing about Croatia they're very um, they're very thingy about um, where they're doing their archaeological work so yeah, all right um, If you do definitely want to join Ellen, then you can join today. <laughs> right, I, I, I'll, de I'll deal with Ellen. Well, right. yeah. is it, you might get a couple of farmers to do Ellen, is this your hat? Are you getting something out of this today? Yes. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, right. If, uh, I don't know. So, <laughs> so, so if, you, if you join, if you join, which is twenty-five pounds a year, it's five pounds. Uh, if you don't join, it's six pounds a session, right? If you join, you get the newsletter and all the rest of it and, and so on. Um, and um, the teas and coffees, you know, the temperatures of the teas, it's expensive coffees, and sometimes I'll bring you. We, we have the weekly back to the farm. Close to me. Yeah. 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 Oh, host to me. You? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Hi, I didn't press the record button um, when I was in class, so this is done at home. So the surprising role cheese played in human evolution cannot be understated. Um, having the ability to make a liquid um, into something solid um, and then to transport that around um, assists um, in the spread of your genes, your family. Um, it keeps you um, alive when food supplies are quite limited. So thinking about the solid mass found in the Egyptian tomb um, less than a decade ago um, from a very important um, individual in Egyptian society, a mayor, Tatmas. Um, Tatmas could be said to uh, require this cheese as a funerary offer offering, something to take into the afterlife, but it fits nicely in with the archaeology, um, analysing uh, this substance, whether it's cheese or goat's milk, um, a significant survivor. So it's not just um, honey that survives or bread that survives for thousands of years, it's in fact cheese as well. 
dairy and diets. Uh, about two thirds of the world's population is lactose intolerant, means that they can't cope with milk. Um, if the lactose has been removed from the cheese, they can have cheese. But most parts of the world, two thirds. Um, that's about 4 billion people on the planet are lactose intolerant. Even people in Europe and North America um, and Northern India um, are lactose intolerant. So, you know, it's, it's quite significant. But those that are, are able to cope with lactose um, have um, done so after a certain level of human evolution. Um, for most of human history, we've been lactose intolerant, but the enzyme lactase has gradually built up um, resilience to lactose. And for for a number of people, as we've said, uh, this is necessary to break down the lactose sugars in fresh milk into compounds that can be easily digestible. Um, children in lots of areas of the world can cope with um, sheep, a goat or pig's milk for a while then they become lactose intolerant whereas lots of people in the western world northern india and so on um, have um, got this enzyme lactase which is a gradually a human evolution if you're lactose intolerant um, it can be fatal um, you can on uh, other levels flatulence diarrhea bloating and sickness uh, so the ancient dna analysis on human skeletons has revealed from prehistoric people that um, the lactase enzyme stats become dominant around 4500 years ago moving on a little bit further um so we see sort of human populations evolving to be um um with to have the um, enzyme lactase um archaeological evidence using a technique called lipid analysis which was pioneered by professor Sharat at the beginning of the 2000s oxford university is no longer with us but lipid analysis basically looking at um, residue left left on shards of ancient pottery um, lipid um, is basically looking at uh, lactic acids remaining on the ancient pottery um, and seeing if the um, pottery has been heated to see if they've had separations of the curds and whey or they're just uh, storage uh, of the um, milk or the cheeses in that container. Um, so we're really starting to see um, how milk is evolving um, fermenting um, into the cheese separating the curds and the whey the whey is the liquid and the curds is the solid mass um, from that wonderful um, nursery rhyme I'm sure we've all heard it um, not just finding evidence for pottery to see of storage storing cheese or actually the cheese itself um, we can actually find the equipment to sort of um, sieve and to process the milk into the cheese itself like clay sieves found in Poland which in fact the ones found in the archaeology are very similar to ones actually found today. Early cheese making while well, the technique from bioarchaeology has provided this fantastic detail on Neolithic diets where the science stops experimental archaeology can can do what's left to explore um, with the utensils available with the storage containers how we're sort of developing the milk into the cheeses and one important thing to say is it's believed that um, cheese itself and the development of cheese um, was brought um, along by the development of bronze um, and copper equipment that aided into um, evolving the cheese you know we all know if you put a copper rod into some soft cheeses in France and Spain uh, you get all that sort of strange greeny colouring in it um, and using copper pans and basins and storage containers it obviously evolves um, and matures and ferments the cheese and so on and obviously you use them to separate the curds and whey as well. Um, in Britain itself at Durrington Walls and lots of the 
images coming up and writings associated with Darrington Wall's English heritage equipment um, and experiments, which we're not really going to talk about. Um, Darrington Wall's excavating, they're, they're finding in the pottery associated with a residue on the pottery telling us that in the Neolithic period, uh, about four, five thousand years ago in the Neolithic period in Britain, um, that we've actually got um, cheeses, whether they're soft or hard cheeses, it's still cheese. Um, one thing that could be said is that um, with the development of cheese offers the ability to allow um, the enzyme lactase to be more prevalent but being able to eat cheese which is low in lactose so you know um, in assess, um, it, uh, it's useful for children well, um, lactose intolerant cheese itself can offer good proteins and a good diet for uh, young children the development of this biological adaptation of fresh milk into cheese um, you all know the adage um, if somebody's uh, put an arsenic in your tea then if you take a little bit of arsenic every single day over a period of time um, you're able to deal with big doses of um, arsenic sorry for that metaphor so manipulation of food itself um, to make them eventually edible for lots of people is where cheese is, where, where cheese is at. I think the final area that I want to look at um, is the Scandinavian cheese. Uh, image is already coming up about this, but the Scandinavian cheese, last few decades have seen the product, product, pro, production sorry, of a vast number of new soft cheeses but there's been lots of soft and hard cheeses throughout the world inspired by old ideas old ingredients uh, most cheeses are made from cow's milk as milking use um, is the in thing um, stat again most cheeses are made from cow's milk um, cow's milk um, cows are easy to milk but milking ewes and goats isn't that easy and even when you do uh, milk, ewes and goats there's a lower yield compared with cattle but with these um, with this valuable goat and ewes milk um, for example in places like Scandinavia in Norway um, it's inspired um, new types of cheeses and cheeses made from ewes and goat milk has been traditionally made in Norway for a very long time maybe two, up to 2,000 years, you've got something known as gamalost, the old cheese, a grainy, slightly crumbling, matured cheese with a strong blue cheese flavour. It's more like really a very really sort of um, a really hardy um, cheddar, kefili cheddar, cheddar, you know, really sort of crumbly, strong cheddar, um, rather than that sort of analogy that looks like a blue cheese. Um, this uh, this gamalost is basically really unobtainable um, outside Norway. Um, not surprising uh, because only um, 200 tons of it made each year, which we worked out was probably the equivalent of I think about 200,000, um, 200,000, 250 grams of cheese. Uh, which if you distributed that through Tesco's in a week, it would all be gone. So you can imagine that um, there's not much left over for the foreign export market. But there was a foreign export market once because this Gambolos cheese was made all over Norway, we're told. And it was the export. The, the Vikings took it with them on their long, long journeys to all those far off places. Gambolos, which means old cheese, is prepared in a village known as Vik. Um Again, another description of pungent golden brown cheese with a crusty texture and strong flavour. Another description there. Made from skimmed cow's milk. But I think um, some of the earliest camelos was made with ewes and goat's cheese. I think that's the why we're looking at this, really. Um, cheese is made from different uh, milks, even pig's, pig's milk as well. Um, it Gamelost... Um, 
contains more than 50% protein, so it's good for that long journey, and 1% fat. Uh, it also contains something known as chitosan, um, with beneficial um, properties, including lowering cholesterol. If you want to lower that cholesterol, get hold of some gamma loss, but before you do, just... Uh, um, get to the end of this piece. The Vikings who fueled themselves for ex expeditions may have fueled themselves on gamma lost, and it was seen as an aphrodisiac as well. 200 tons of gamma lost may seem a lot per year, but it's not, as we've already said. They've even got a festival um, for the gamma lost cheese, so I'm sure a couple of tons is consumed in that alone. Although the tradition of making gamma lost is an old one, the name of the cheese. Um, comes from its long history. Um, ah, start again. The name of the cheese comes not from its long history, but from the length of the aging process. There you go, from its aging process. Um, traditionally, after the milk had been soured, the curds were heated in copper cauldrons. Again, copper, copper rods. There you go. Then transferred into wooden moulds lined with jute or linen or even um, dried marsh grass, for example, um, all to help with the aging and all to help with the taste. Every other day during the, um, the period when it's maturing, now this is why maybe before you go out and buy Gamalost, listen to this next line, the cheese had to be rubbed by hand to facilitate the absorption of the necessary bacteria. So in other words, um, dirty hands are needed to give the cheese a really pungent, unique taste. Um, and that bacteria from your hands needs to be rubbed onto the cheese to mature it. Nice. These days, modern dairy production methods have reduced the aging process from an entire summer to two weeks. Still, the principle of Gamalos, the taste and the bacteria and the hands and the aroma is still there. It's not necessary to everybody's taste, um, but I'm told it's good on a nice bit of biscuit uh, with a, maybe a bit of honey or jam or maple syrup. I've tasted personally. I've tasted something like Gamalost. One of my students, Lynn, brought some a Norwegian brownie-looking cheese in the other day, which we had on some crackers in my lunch major class. So that was nice. Um, so if you're ever travelling to the Chandavjord region of Norway. Look up that cheese and possibly why we've ended with this and why I've even put it in is maybe Gamalost is that sort of taste of a very old cheese. A cheese that maybe has its date, um, um, its origins beyond 2,000 years ago. Maybe they've been making this cheese for a very, very long time. Um, and similar cheeses, it, cheeses like the Gamalost in other parts of the world. Anyway. Hopefully if you enjoyed this video, it's always good when people um, hear me talking live when I'm in class. But um, thank you for listening today and watching and hopefully you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much.